Uh, good evening, everyone. Today I would like to talk about the search for life in the universe, which is part of a discipline known as astrobiology. And the questions of interest are as follows. How did it all happen? How did we end up with this beautiful planet capable of sustaining life? Why is this universe habitable? And why is this planet habitable? Are there other planets that are habitable? And is there life elsewhere? Is there intelligent life elsewhere? And could we establish contact with another civilization? So these are big, engrossing questions. And we're very fortunate to live at a time where we can actually hope to have the answers to these questions during our lifetime. The search for life uh, in the universe represents one of the most important scientific and philosophical questions. Um, if we attempt to define life right now, we're very limited because we only have one data point. All life on Earth is connected to a common ancestor, which makes it very, very difficult for us to imagine the possibilities of other life forms. And so we're very much blinded by the fact that we have this one data point. And it would be a phenomenal advance in our knowledge and understanding if we could get a sample of another form of life. So let's start at the beginning. It all started with the Big Bang, which happened everywhere in space and marked the beginning of time. And since the Big Bang, space-time has been expanding and the distance between galaxies has been growing. And for reasons that we do not fully understand, this universe ended up with four fundamental forces whose strengths are such that they allow for the emergence and evolution of life. For instance, the electromagnetic force allows for atoms to combine and form molecules, which are obviously important for life. Gravity allows for matter to accumulate and form stars and planets, which are also important for life. Now, the Big Bang left us with essentially hydrogen and helium, and that's not sufficient for life. Uh, life requires carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on. These elements were formed deep down in the interiors of stars, where the pressure and temperature temperature conditions are such that the lighter elements can combine into the heavier elements. So most of the stuff of life, and most of what we're made of, was formed deep inside the core of a previous generation star. So as Carl Sagan said, we are star stuff. We have a very deep connection to the stars. Now, the search for life generally focuses on searching for environments where liquid water exists. And the reason for that is that life requires very long molecules to encode and transmit all the information that is necessary for life to reproduce and to build all the machinery required for organisms. And it turns out that assembling these very long molecules is much easier in a solvent like liquid water. And liquid has a number of chemical and physical properties that make it ideal for this process. I'm just going to highlight one of the properties here, which is the range of temperatures at which, liquid, at which water remains liquid, uh, which is quite large compared to other solvents. We typically also search for carbon-based life, although we're not ruling out the possibility that other forms of life may use different atoms. Carbon has a number of interesting properties as well, and they're described in this diagram, which is the periodic table of elements, and describes why carbon is ideal. So if you look at uh, the column on the right, for instance, these are the noble gases or inert gases. These elements are perfectly content with the number of electrons that they have, and they're not willing to share with anyone. They're not willing to engage. They're like the people who go to the party and stand by the wall and don't interact. You try to engage them, but they don't respond. Uh, there's no chemistry there. So those are not good for life. Uh, the column immediately to the left, uh, these elements are willing to trade one electron, and that can result in some chemistry, but it's very boring chemistry, and it's not sufficient for life. Carbon is willing to trade four electrons and share four electrons with all kinds of other elements, and in addition to that, it also forms very strong bonds, enabling these long macromolecules to form. So carbon is uh, an essential element for life. 
Now, is it easy or is it hard to form the molecules of life, the stuff that forms our DNA, uh, and so on and so forth? It turns out it's remarkably easy. And this was first demonstrated in the 50s by uh, an experiment uh, produced by Harold Urey and Stanley Miller. And it's called the primordial soup. And it's a very simple setup. And you can do this in your kitchen. So let me give you the, the recipe. Uh, you take a big flask and you pour in uh, elements that are very abundant, uh, molecules that are very abundant in the universe. Water, methane, ammonia. Uh, you just let it simmer there, and you provide a source of energy. And that can be anything. It could be hot rocks, it could be UV light, cosmic rays, you name it. You let it simmer for a week, and there you have it. 20 of life's essential amino acids are produced without any intervention, just based on these ingredients that are very abundant in the universe and with conditions that are probably very common in the universe as well. In fact, these amino acids exist in interstellar space, and they also are present in meteorites. This is a photo of uh, the fall of a meteorite in Northern California in uh, Gold Rush Country about five years ago. There was a lot of excitement about this uh, fall, and within days of the fall, I flew to participate uh, in the search. Um, the prospect of finding fragments of a 4.6 billion year old piece of rock that contains the basic building blocks of life was just too enthralling to resist. So we have all the building blocks of life, now we just need to find a place to live. So let's try to quantify how many habitable worlds there are out there. And a few years ago, I was in Yosemite with a number of UCLA students, and we were contemplating our connection uh, to the stars. We were looking, observing the night sky, and I was telling them, you know, the calcium in your bones comes from the death of a previous generation star. Um, it just so happens that uh, we were looking at the place of the sky where the Kepler telescope uh, has been uh, observing for several years. Uh, right next to the constellation Cygnus, on the left is a photo taken by one of the students, and you can see Cygnus here, uh, highlighted in red. And on the right, there's the constellation Cygnus and the location of the Kepler field. Now, the Kepler Space Telescope contains 42 digital cameras, very much like the camera in your cell phone. And it's stared at this part of the sky continuously for several years. It's about the size of your fist at arm's length. It's about 10 degrees by 10 degrees. Now, some of us were uh, fortunate to observe the transit of Venus a, a few years ago. Uh, which is a great way to explain how the Kepler telescope works. When a planet passes in front of a star, in this case is a time-lapse photography of Venus passing in front of the Sun, the total amount of light that you observe from the star is diminished a little bit because the planet is occulting some of the light. So Kepler continuously recorded these light variations for more than 100,000 stars and inferred the presence of planets by this technique. Kepler has been a phenomenal success. Uh, I think that it has revolutionized astronomy, and in fact, I call it the second Copernican revolution. This diagram explains why. This is the state of our knowledge before the Kepler telescope, uh, showing planetary masses and orbital periods. And we, before Kepler, we knew of very few uh, Earth-sized planets. Here's the situation after Kepler. All of these are thousands of discoveries from the Kepler telescope. And for the first time, we've been able to really get a handle on what planetary systems look like and how many planets there are. In my research group, we've used the Kepler data to quantify the architecture of planetary systems. How closely aligned are the orbits of individual planets? And it turns out that they're very flat. Uh, the geometry is somewhere between that of a crepe and a pancake. And that is true of the solar system also. We've also used the Kepler data to show that most planetary systems are full. In other words, if you try to inject another planet anywhere in the system, the whole system becomes dynamically unstable very quickly, and one or two planets gets ejected. So these are exciting findings from Kepler. But the most important, the most exciting findings uh, from Kepler are about the abundance of planets. Kepler has shown that every star has at least one planet, on average. And it has shown that most planets are Earth-size, as this diagram over here shows. About half of all stars 
have one terrestrial-sized planet. That means that in our galaxy alone, there are hundreds of billions of Earth-sized planets. Now, what does that number mean? If you could count the planets at a rate of one per second, let's say one, two, three, etc., it would take you 3,000 years to complete the count. And that's just in our galaxy. There are two trillion galaxies out there in the observable universe. So to get a sense for how many planets there are in the observable universe, you have to imagine yourself already in Barcelona at the beach, and you now need to count the grains of dry sand on the beach. Can you picture yourself doing that? Now imagine doing that on all the beaches on Earth. The number of planets in the observable universe is roughly comparable to all the grains of dry sand on all the beaches on Earth. Right? It's a truly astounding number. So we have lots and lots of planets, but which ones are habitable? We know the answer in the solar system. We have eight planets, and at least one of them is habitable. Kepler has quantified the number of planets that are in the habitable zone. This is the region of space where water can exist in liquid form. And it has shown that, again, in this galaxy alone, there are tens of billions of habitable planets. Tens of billions of planets with life-sustaining potential just in this galaxy. So we live at a very, very interesting time in the history of science. This equation was written by astronomer Frank Drake, who's my academic grandfather, and it quantifies how many communicative civilizations there are in the galaxy. And for decades, we were completely ignorant about two of the factors in this equation. And today, just in the last five years, we found out, thanks to Kepler, about two of these factors. And we know that the numbers are high, right? Tens of billions of habitable worlds in this galaxy. So the prospects for life seem to be pretty good. And I've only talked about planets so far, but there are other worlds that could be suitable for life as well. Here's a family portrait of some of the worlds of the solar system, and I'm going to talk briefly about a few of them that might be interesting uh, for a search for life. So Mars, for instance, Titan, a satellite of Saturn, uh, Europa, a satellite of Jupiter, and Enceladus, another satellite of uh, Saturn. Mars is an interesting place. It is completely inhospitable right now. It is dry, it is cold, it is a miserable place. But there's evidence in the geologic record that Mars was once much warmer and there was liquid water flowing on the surface and possibly also standing bodies of water. And some of these environments may have been suitable for life to arise and evolve. And therefore, Mars is a very interesting and very important place uh, to observe and to explore. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. It is also the only moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. And that atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, very much like Earth's atmosphere, and the pressure at the surface of Titan is very similar to the pressure on Earth. There are lakes and rivers of hydrocarbons on Titan. So these are other environments that might be interesting uh, to explore as well. Europa, a satellite of Jupiter, uh, is a fascinating world. It, it is covered by an icy crust that is filled with cracks that open and close as Europa orbits Jupiter. There's very strong evidence that under this icy crust, there's a global ocean that is several times larger than all of Earth's oceans combined. So a lot of liquid water under the ice shell. And the big question is, how thick is that ice shell? If it's thin, the prospects for life are reasonably good. If it's thick, they're probably not so good. In my research group, we're using large ground-based telescopes to try to quantify the thickness of the ice shell. And we're also participating in NASA's next flagship mission, the Europa Clipper mission, that will go to uh, Jupiter and uh, uh, encounter Europa multiple times to try to infer uh, its properties and evaluate its potential for life, including, again, the thickness of the ice shell. Enceladus uh, is much smaller. Uh, it's about a tenth of the size of Titan in, in diameter. Um, and it's a very reflective, very bright 
uh, satellite, which means it's also extremely cold. It's about minus 200 Celsius or minus 325 Fahrenheit on Enceladus. It's extremely cold. However, the South Pole uh, of Enceladus has very interesting geyser-like activity. There are plumes composed primarily of water emanating from the surface, about a bathtub worth of water every second. Uh, so Enceladus is also an interesting place to look for life. There's also evidence for a global subsurface ocean at Enceladus. So we are fortunate to live in a universe where the molecules of life, the elements of life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, are abundant, and where the laws of physics allow for the formation of stars and planets and people, and where the laws of chemistry allow for the formation of these uh, molecules of life. And so it's relatively simple to conceive of a universe where you have a Big Bang and then uh, according to the laws of physics and chemistry, you have formation of planetary systems and molecules of life, and life emerges uh, and evolve. And it's not unreasonable to think that this, uh, that this has happened in multiple places. And in fact, you might even think that it may happen in every place where the conditions are suitable. I would also argue that it's not unreasonable to think that intelligent life may have evolved elsewhere. The search for life in the universe uh, uses two primary techniques. Um, the first one is called the search for biosignature, and a biosignature is any evidence for biological activity. The second technique is called the search for technosignatures, and a technosignature is any evidence for an advanced civilization that manifests itself in a way that we can detect. So let me talk about biosignatures first. The two primary uh, techniques in the search for, te uh, for biosignatures include uh, robotic instruments, very sophisticated robotic instruments going to the surfaces of Mars or Europa and sniffing and scratching and trying to detect molecules of life. The second one shown on the right is building very sophisticated telescopes, putting them up in space above the Earth's atmosphere so that they have a clear uh, path for light and observe the atmospheres of exoplanets, a few exoplanets uh, relatively nearby. I'm excited about both of these uh, initiatives and I support them because the questions are very important, finding life elsewhere is very important, but I do think that the search for technosignatures actually has three advantages compared to these. So let's talk about cost first. Um, by the time we get a sample back from Mars, we will have spent about $10 billion. And by the time the James Webb Space Telescope is up in space, we'll have spent close to $10 billion. So uh, again, uh, I support very much these initiatives, but they are sort of pricey. The second uh, element is the surge volume. For the robotic instruments, we have literally a handful of places that we can go explore. And for the telescopic searches, we have maybe a few dozen planetary systems that are close enough that we can actually do the search for biosignatures. So a tiny little bubble around us in the Milky Way galaxy. And finally, I'll talk about information content as the third advantage that I see in the search for technosignatures. So the cost of a search for technosignature is actually very modest compared to these other two techniques. Uh, for $10 million, not billion, $10 million per year, you can have a very substantial, very thorough search for technosignatures. The search volume is about a million times larger. I will show that we can uh, receive signals from a very large fraction of the galaxy, as opposed to just a handful or a few dozen targets. And I also want to address the information content. Now, there's something very important to understand about the search for life in the universe. Um, and it's illustrated here. If you place the history of the universe on a one-year calendar with the Big Bang on January 1st, and we're here today on New Year's Eve at the last second before midnight, you can put various elements in the history of life on this calendar. So the Earth forms in early September. The dinosaurs die on December 30th. Modern humans arrive on the scene in the last couple of minutes on the last day of this calendar. And we develop our technology or ability to communicate with other civilizations in the last second on the last day of this one-year calendar. 
Now, the question that you have to ask yourself is if we detect a signal from another civilization, what is the probability that they developed their technology in that one second slice of the cosmic calendar? It's almost impossible, right? It is almost a certainty that they've developed their technology at some other time in this calendar. So we have the potential to establish contact with a civilization that is far more advanced than we are. Maybe thousands of years more advanced than we are, or maybe millions of years more advanced than we are. Imagine the possibilities. Imagine what we could learn if we detected a signal. The impact on science, technology, medicine, the arts, philosophy, it's just astounding. And that is why I've decided to devote part of my time to uh, the search for techno signatures. Now, is it realistic to think that we could detect these signals? And the answer is yes. A simple calculation shows that even with our fairly primitive instruments compared to other civilizations, uh, we can establish contact uh, for about a, th a thousand light years if we assume, for instance, that they have an Arecibo telescope. This is a picture of the Arecibo telescope, one of the largest on Earth. It's about a thousand feet across. So if they have the similar kind of instrument, uh, we could establish contact in a very substantial fraction of the galaxy. If they have a transmitter that's only a thousand times more powerful, we can establish contact all the way to the center of the galaxy and have an enormous surge volume. So what are we doing about this? Um, we have the potential to address one of the most important scientific questions and, and learn uh, an, an enormous amount, get an enormous amount of information, and yet there's zero federal funding going to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There are private efforts, and people contribute with computer resources or financial resources, but there's zero federal funding. At UCLA, we're trying to establish a center where, with a $5 million endowment, we'll be able to purchase 100 hours of telescope time every year in perpetuity and fund a graduate student in perpetuity to do uh, the search. And in fact, for the past few years, I've um, engaged undergraduate students and graduate students at UCLA in the search. We teach a course every year called the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. We use the world's largest fully steerable telescope on the planet, the Green Bank Telescope. It's a wonderful instrument. Um, and we get terabytes of data every year. The students select the planetary systems that they want to observe. And this is what the first class of students decided to observe. They chose to observe small habitable zone planets in the Kepler field. And I've shown the names of the students next to the targets that they selected. So some of the systems, for instance, are Kepler-62, which has uh, planets in the habitable zone, or Kepler-186, which has an Earth-sized planet uh, in the habitable zone as well. Here's the full list of uh, planets uh, that we observed, and we observe them in the classroom. So we project all the telescope controls on the screen. The students not only get to design the observing program, but they also get to participate in the observations. And after that, we download all our data, and we write software. All the students write software to analyze the data. Uh, we work in small teams, and we collaborate. So all of us contribute different parts of the data processing pipeline, and we pull it all together with um, a collaborative software platform. And again, I've shown the names of the students here on different elements of the pipeline that we've built uh, as a result of the class. In the process, the students learn all kinds of interesting skills and useful skills for the workplace. They learn about signal processing. We do Fourier transforms. They learn about statistics. They learn about database design and management. So these are uh, very useful skills that uh, the students develop while they are engaged in the search uh, for signals. Now here are some examples of our results. Uh, this diagram shows the power of a uh, signal as a function of time on the vertical axis, time increasing down, and as a function of frequency on the horizontal axis, frequency increasing to the right. We're looking for signals that are very narrow in frequency. And this is analogous to you when you're looking for a radio on your radios, um, for a radio station on your radio. You're, 
you have to be right on frequency to get uh, the transmission that you're trying to uh, receive. If we detect a signal that is narrow in frequency, and if we can show that it is extraterrestrial, our job is done, because nature does not produce these signals. And if we detect such a signal, we will know that there is another civilization out there. There's no ambiguity. So it's a very straightforward search, in a sense, compared to these other searches where, you know, if you detect a molecule in an atmosphere on exoplanets, we're going to argue for a very, very long time about whether it's actually produced by life or by geology. And even if, it do, if we do convince ourselves that it's life, we won't know what kind of life it is. Uh, in this case, if we detect a signal, uh, we can show that there's an, a civilization intelligent enough to design a transmitter that can produce these kinds of waveforms. In every hour of telescope time, we detect about a million candidate signals. And al almost all of them are terrestrial. Uh, they're generated by human technology. So most of the software that we write actually has to do with classifying these signals and separating the terrestrial signals from uh, extraterrestrial signals. We've written a number of filters that do this automatically. Uh, our first generation was able to eliminate 99% of the signal, and our goal is to get to 99.99% uh, to do an even better job. So we're using techniques such as machine learning uh, to improve our filters. Here's another example of a signal that changes frequency uh, as a function of time. And again, if we detected such a signal, there would be absolutely no ambiguity that this would be generated by an extraterrestrial civilization if we can show that it comes from a specific direction on the sky and is not due to uh, human technology. We've published our uh, first set of results in the Astronomical Journal, and because the students were instrumental in writing the data processing pipeline, they are all co-authors on the paper. So they're very excited about that, and so am I. Here's the second class uh, of students. Um, and this class of students, again, uh, wanted to look at small habitable zone planets in the Kepler field, but they also wanted to observe newly discovered systems, such as TRAPPIST-1. Uh, you may have heard of TRAPPIST-1. It's a very compact system of seven Earth-sized planets uh, with a couple in the habitable zone. So that's what that class uh, decided to do. And we just concluded the third edition of the course. This is the third class of students. Um, the class has become by far my favorite. And there are a couple of reasons for that. It's a hugely satisfying course to teach uh, for two reasons. One is every year we build on what we've built in previous years. And so we're gradually improving our pipeline. It's becoming more versatile. It's becoming more robust. And it's a lot of fun for both me and the students to see that we're uh, improving our capabilities that way. And the, perhaps the most satisfying aspect of the course is to see the eagerness of the students to learn um, all this material, which um, you know, is hard material to learn. Um, but they are very eager, very dedicated, because um, it's engrossed. They're all engrossed in the search for life in the universe. So that's, to me, personally, very satisfying. All right, so how can you get involved in the search? Um, you can go to a website or s at seti.ucla.edu, and uh, if you want, you can subscribe to our newsletter. We, we, if you want to keep up with what we're doing, uh, we write an occasional newsletter, tell, us, uh, tell you about our, pro our progress. Um, so that's one way you can uh, follow our progress. Uh, the second way, we're trying to offer the class again next year, and every year, you know, we're purchasing a couple of hours of telescope times, that costs about $5,000. So every year we need to raise $5,000. Uh, we're also filling up our data servers uh, because these terabytes of data very quickly expand as we do the data analysis. Um, so we're in need of another 100 terabyte server, and that's about ten dollars to $15,000. And then again, I mentioned uh, the need for a graduate student. Um, I spend a small fraction of my time doing this because I'm doing all kinds of other things at the university, including service and committees and so on and so forth, other courses that I'm teaching. Uh, it would be phenomenal to have a full-time graduate sp student spending 100% of their time uh, improving the algorithms and contributing to the search. So I've made the talk uh, deliberately short to allow time for questions. And so that's all I have to say. And I'll open up the floor for questions. Thank you.
Yes. All right, so let me see if I can go back to the Drake equation. Um, so n is the number of communicative civilizations, and it depends on uh, the rate of star formation. Uh, that's the first factor. It's about 10 stars per year. Then the fraction of stars that have planets. This is one of the numbers we didn't know, and now we know the fraction is 100%, pretty much. Uh, the next factor, number of Earth-like planets or habitable planets. And again, we didn't know that number until very recently, and now we know that it's um, you know, one-tenth or so. The next three factors are the fraction that life develops, intelligent life develops, and communicative life develops. And these are still very much unknown. So they could be small. But because the numbers at the front are so large, uh, even if these numbers are small, the probability that there's a, a communicative civilization other than ours uh, I think is non-zero. And that's what I tell the, student, the, the students. The probability is low, but it's not zero. This is just for the Milky Way galaxy because it's the rate of star formation in the galaxy. So again, there are two trillion galaxies. Um, it's, it's more difficult to establish contact with other galaxies because they're further away and the strength of the signal diminishes as the square of the distance. Uh, but it's not impossible. Uh, not in our search, but there are actually uh, there are known searches that where um, astronomers have looked at uh, other galaxies on purpose, looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. So it, you know it would require powerful transmitters, maybe beacons, intentionally designed beacons, uh, to make someone's presence known, uh, but yeah, it's possible. Yes. Go ahead. Can, can you speak up? I can't hear you. Currently, we look at the pattern of power in the time frequency space. Um, so we're not necessarily thinking about how the signal is encoding is encoded at this point. We're just looking at a signal that is sufficiently narrow band, or s or it could be pulsed. Also, uh, anything that cannot be produced by nature would be satisfactory to us. And that's the first part: is the detection. If there is a detection, the first thing we would do is confirm it, have others confirm it, go to other telescope, uh, telescopes, ask others to confirm the, the detection. And then only would you try to decode whatever signal it is. And you know, again, it could be an inten intentional transmission that might have a code of some kind, or it could be unintentional, you know, some radar system or something like that. Um, so the content, the information content, depends a little bit on what it is that is detected. Yeah, back there. I can't hear. Uh, the question is about, is there a protocol f uh, after a detection is made? Yes, there is a protocol that's been agreed and ratified by a number of international organizations. Uh, you can find it on the web. Uh, and again, it, it, it's basic scientific process, right? So first, replicate the result, have others replicate the result. Uh, there's a clause in there that says that the discoverer of the signal should have the privilege of making the first public announcement. But you, know, you make the announcement very, pu very soon to enable others to replicate and characterize the signal. Um, and then the last clause, I think, is don't respond <laughs> until uh, there's appropriate consultation. Um, the prospect of two-way communication is not that great because the distances are pretty large, and so the time it takes for the signal to uh, travel is very large. So I'm looking at this not so much as a two-way communication, but primarily as a detection exercise. Yes. Yes. 
So th are you asking about whether other life forms have had enough time to evolve? Uh, I disagree with that claim, and the reason is that uh, stars that are more massive than the, sur than the sun have very short lifetimes. Um, so you can have many, many generations of stars long before the sun forms. And so you can have these elements that are required for life long before the sun forms. So I, I do think that there may be civilizations there that are ancient, maybe extinct already. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, you're asking about the, the Fermi paradox. Where are the aliens? Um, so the <laughs> um, this is an interesting uh, concept that you may have heard about. It's called the Fermi paradox, although it's not clear that it was due to Fermi, and it's not clear at all that it's a paradox either. And the question is, if there is so much potential for uh, life elsewhere, why haven't we found any evidence here on Earth or nearby? Uh, and the idea is that if they're advanced, they can probably colonize the entire galaxy very easily, and so on and so forth. Um, Anna said this the other day. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And so, to me, it's entirely possible that there are civilizations out there and they have not bothered to interact with us. In fact, they may not even know we're here because we've only been communicating for 50 or 70 years or so, and so the bubble of the radio waves that have left the Earth is tiny compared to the size of the galaxy. So there may be civilizations there that either don't know or don't care to interact with us. So to me, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, bother me at all that we haven't found a piece of hardware uh, uh, so far. I do think that the potential for detecting, again, inten intentional or non-intentional, unintentional communications uh, exists. Yes. How many different efforts are engaged in the search? Um, let's see, there, there used to be a famous quote that uh, there were fewer people doing this than uh, cooks in a McDonald's or something like that. There are not that many groups, uh, although by now we've trained about 50 students at UCLA <laughs> uh, into doing this. Um, but the, uh, there's the, the primary, the most well-funded initiative is the Breakthrough Listen initiative, and that's a private-funded uh, initiative. Um, um, and then there are uh, small, smaller groups uh, in Europe. Uh, the Chinese also, uh, with their new large radio telescope, have an interest in SETI. Uh, there's, uh, the Australians are involved. Um, but it's, it's a relatively small number of groups. Um, and, and it is collaborative in the sense that uh, it's, a, it's a supportive community and we exchange results and, and um, yeah. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Right, so at UCLA, I've been very, very fortunate that some UCLA alumni and friends of the university have contributed, and they've made it happen. I mean, without their support, uh, we would not... So, I'm sorry, I... Oh, yes, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go to a website, sedi.ucla.edu, and there's a donate button. And we'll be very grateful if you help us enabling uh, the next uh, course. Thank you. Yes.
right? Uh, so the question is, are we uh, detectable by other civilizations? And in fact, one of the reviewers of our paper asked specifically that we address this in our, in our article. And so there's now a small paragraph in the paper that describes uh, to what distances the Arecibo telescope is detectable. So Arecibo has a one megawatt transmitter that we use for studies of the solar system. Uh, and indeed, it is detectable thousands of light years away. Um, and for some observations, the telescope points in one direction on the sky sufficiently long that um, you know, another civilization would have a decent shot at uh, detecting us. Um, but again, that signal travels at the speed of light, and so it will take you know, 10,000 years, you know, 30,000 years before it reaches the center of the galaxy. So it's not a concern. I don't lose any sleep over it. Um, and it's also not necessary that another civilization waits for our signal to, to have a beacon. They may want to have a beacon that's omnidirectional just to announce, you know, we're here and make their presence known. Could we do that and should we do that? That's a very interesting question. So do we want to engage in uh, what's sometimes known as METI, uh, or the, the messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence? Uh, it's a very uh, controversial question with very strong opinions on both sides. My, my personal opinion um, is that at our stage, we don't have a whole lot to contribute. We're not, we're, we're not that sophisticated, <laughs> in a sense. Um, compared to civilizations that are maybe thousands or millions of years uh, older than we are. And so I think the most productive approach for us is to do the listening. Um, and then, you know, in the future, it might be uh, something to consider. But at this stage, uh, with our present technology, we wouldn't be able to uh, transmit very powerful signals, for instance. Um, so, you know, that's my personal uh, inclination. I, I do know about people who feel very strongly that we should be broadcasting. Uh, that, so, you know, there are different opinions about that. Yes? I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I still cannot hear you. Oh! Uh, Can somebody repeat? There's fans out here. I can't hear you. All right. So two great questions. <laughs> um, the evidence for a subsurface ocean at Europa is primarily due to Margaret Kivelson, who is a professor at UCLA. She's a phenomenal person. She was the principal investigator on the magnetometer instrument on the Galileo spacecraft. And they measured the magnetic field near Europa, and they were able to show that this magnetic field changed orientation in a way that cannot happen if you have a solid body. You have to have a liquid medium, conductive medium, underneath the ice shell. Uh, there are other lines of evidence. Uh, in fact, some of my research involves measuring the orientation of the spin of Europa. And I've measured that to uh, an accuracy that shows that, again, it cannot be a solid body. It has to have a shell that is decoupled from the interior of the planet. Uh, there is also geological evidence. The surface of Europa looks broken apart, uh, much like a jigsaw puzzle. And it looks like there's iceberg-like features that have floated around. Uh, so there's several lines of evidence that support um, the, the claim of a subsurface ocean. So I've, I'm pretty confident about it, and I think the consensus in the community is that we're pretty confident that there's a, a subsurface ocean there. Uh, Europa Clipper will further cement that finding. Uh, as I said, there's a gravity investigation that will measure the amplitude of the tide. Uh, the amplitude of the tide on Europa is 100 feet. Uh, it's enormous, right? and it happens every three and a half days, and this entire crust is, gonna, is, is moving by 100, foot, um, by 100 feet every day, or every Europa day. Um, so the gravity investigation will be sensitive to that and will confirm uh, the presence of the ocean. Uh, your second question has to do with how do we distinguish whether the signal is terrestrial or extraterrestrial. Uh, one of the most important thing... I'm sorry? Right, so 
one of the most important filters that we have is that the signal can only come from one direction on the sky. If we detect the signal from multiple directions on the sky, it, directions on the sky it's almost certainly an interference that's gotten into the side lobes of the antenna. Uh, so that's one thing we look for. Can, can somebody repeat that? I'm sorry. Oh, um, the, the types of signals we're looking for are not uh, um, produced by astrophysical sources. They're too narrow. The narrowest signal that astrophysical sources produce are hundreds of hertz. They're masers. Um, we're looking for signals that are hertz wide or three hertz wide or 10 hertz wide. There's no source uh, in astrophysics that can produce these signals. So that's, how we that's why we would feel confident if we detected such a narrow band signal that it has to have an intelligence behind it to design a transmitter that can generate the signal. Nature just can't produce these signals. Yes? That is an excellent question. What, you know, could it be robotic or artificial intelligence? Uh, that's entirely plausible. Um, these bodies are not that great, right? They're not that durable. Uh, and so you can imagine that in future generations, uh, we will try to make them more robust and possibly become more robotic, more uh, machine-based. Uh, so it's entirely plausible that there are civilizations out there that are primarily uh, robotic or, or artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yes. Uh, promising candidates, yes. In our article, we focused on 19 signals that we initially could not attribute to uh, terrestrial interference. And so we scrutinized them. And after we looked at them carefully, we decided, no, they're in fact all terrestrial based. So we have, so far, no uh, candidates left. Uh, but we do have just you know, acquired a brand new data set that we're going to be analyzing this summer and um, looking for additional candidates. Yes? So the, the wow signal was uh, detected, I can't remember exactly when, uh, decades ago. And it, uh, it was part of a, a radio astronomy survey, and there was a large amplitude, large power signal that has been unexplained or not explained satisfactorily. Um, one of the recent developments with the WOW signal is that there was a question as to whether it might have been uh, detection of a comet and some of the molecules in a comet. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I do know that many people uh, have tried to look in that part of the sky and try to reproduce the detection, and there's never been a repeat uh, detection. So it's still somewhat unexplained. Yes. Right, so that, the question is about the fraction of the sky that we cover. Uh, at the frequency that we observe with the Green Bank Telescope, the size of the beam is about nine arc minutes. And if you do the math, that's about um, 10 parts per million of the entire area of the sky. So 10 to the minus five, one part in 100,000. So for each one of the pointings, we do uh, 10 parts per million of the entire sky. And indeed, that's one of the reasons we're trying to establish a center is to increase the amount of observing time so that we can cover more of the sky. Yes? Yeah. 
so the, the instrument that we use uh, at the moment uh, is capable of recording about 800 megahertz of bandwidth. So that's 800 million individual channels if, you, if you're thinking of a search at one hertz resolution. So it's, it's, a, it's quite considerable in terms of frequency coverage. I'm sorry. I, I can't hear. Um, yeah, we've, we've done searches at three hertz resolution primarily. Right. So there's, there's a metric that Frank Drake, who was a pioneer in SETI, uh, 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 that Frank Drake came up with, that describes the sensitivity of the search and the volume of the search. Um, so we've computed that metric for our search. Um, and let's see, we, we covered about 12% of uh, the entire history of the Allen Telescope Array uh, the Allen Telescope Array was built specifically for SETI, and they had surveys over five years um, to look for artificial intelligence. And um, the telescope we're using is far more sensitive, and therefore we can search a much larger volume. Um, so, you know, that gives you a relative sense. It doesn't give you an absolute sense over, you know, the entirety of the search volume. Um, but we can quantify that. Oh, in our search, um, let's see how many <laughs> how many grains of sand have we searched? Uh, let's see, about 50 planetary systems, and let's assume so you know about 200 grains of sand. Right, but that's you know in the context of two hours a year for the past three years, we're trying to get to hundreds of hours per year. Somebody repeat again. Um, th that's correct. The the strength of the signal depends on the uh, transmitter power. So we cover that in our paper. We make an assumption if they have an Arecibo class transmitter, this is how far we can detect them. If they have a thousand times an Arecibo class transmitter, this is how far we can detect them. Right, so the question, the 200 grains of sand, we don't, you know, we obviously don't know what transmitter power uh, they're using. Right. It's a small fraction, I'll grant you that. And again, there's a famous saying that says, if you don't search, you'll never find it. Right. Is there a question in the back? Oh, go ahead. That, so, yes, I've talked about technosignatures. There are uh, lots of scientists involved in the search for biosignatures, and they are looking for um, evidence of biological activity on a few places in the solar system or around a few dozen uh, uh, exoplanetary uh, systems. Um, and that search is ongoing and it's well funded. Uh, and my argument is that we ought to fund this search for techno signatures as well. It's really unclear which one is going to be uh, successful first. But in either case, it's, ca it's actually kind of exciting that we may find the answer during our lifetime. All right, I think we're supposed to stop. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for attending. Uh